official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official so uh, today we're going to begin to start talking about how to uh, start executing queries and running operations on, on the data that, that are coming up from, from the scans that they're doing down below. Again, reminder of everything for you guys. Homework 3 is due this Sunday coming up. The plan is to have it due this Sunday and then give you out the solutions and graded responses by the following Monday because you'll need it for the exam on next Wednesday. Um, Project 2, again, we do after... Uh, after fall break on the 27th. And as I posted last night in Piazza, there's now an online study guide with a practice exam you can use with the solutions and explanations. Uh, and then there's the study guide tells you basically what you need to do. The main thing you need to be show up is with your CMU ID, so we know who is who when, when you fill it out. Okay? Any questions about any of these things? Again, homework three is due the Sunday. We'll, we'll get you get out the, the answers by, by Monday morning. Okay? So... Oh. So, as I said uh, last time, like, now that we've discussed like, how to actually build indexes and how to actually uh, organize, organize the data on the disk, again, we're now going up the stack further, and we can talk about how do we take all those components we've built so far and, and run queries on them. So for the next four lectures, we're going to talk basically the low-level operator algorithms we need, need to, to execute you know, full, more, more complicated queries, uh, how we actually want to organize the system to, to to process those, those queries and process, meaning how do we move data between the, the different operators in our query plan. And then we'll talk a little bit about the runtime architecture for how you actually build a system, make, whether you make it multi-threaded, multi-process, and so forth. Again, we're focusing on single node systems today, or for, for this part of the lecture, but we'll see how we can extend all these things to do distributed execution uh, later in the semester. Okay? And again, for this, today's lecture, this will be on the, on the, on the, um, on the midterm. Monday's class and going forward will not be in the midterm. Oops, sorry, getting the wrong button. All right, so we saw this diagram earlier in the semester uh, of, of a query plan, right? I said roughly that you take the SQL query, you run it some parser, it generates an abstract syntax tree, and then from the abstract syntax tree, you, you can then generate a, a query plan. We haven't talked about like, exactly what the query plan looks like and what these operators actually look like just yet, but at a high level, you can think of it as a tree, oftentimes, it, most times it's going to be a tree. Uh, it's better to be a DAG, but most systems don't do that. And the idea is that in the, the leaf nodes of the tree is where we're going to be reading data from, from some source, like from a table, from a file, you know, some, some lower part of the system. And data is going to move up from one operator to the next, right? So in this case here, we're scanning R. We feed this up into a join operator. We do a join on S. We feed this up to projection. And then the top, the root node where the projection is, that's the final output that we're sending back to the, to the client, right? to, to the response for the, this query. And so this is obviously a PowerPoint diagram. It doesn't say anything about what these blocks of data that I'm moving around are, right? what the granularity is, how often we're doing it. Uh, is the bottom pushing it up? Are we pulling it up? Right? There's a bunch of those things we'll discuss after fall break. But at a high level, this is the general idea that data is flowing from one operator to the next uh, in order to compute some portion of the query, and then the, the root or the top of the tree is what the client gets as, as the final output, right? So since we've been talking all semester about disk-oriented systems, right, we, the same assumption we had before that when we want to do something on a piece of data or a table or some collection of data, that we can't assume that everything's going to fit in main memory, we're going to have the same issue when we actually start running these operators that implement the, the, the nodes in the query plan uh, where we can't assume that the intermediate results of, of these operators fit entirely in DRAM or fit, fit entirely in memory, right? Going back here, what if it's the case that, like, I only have a gig of, a gig of memory, but R is feeding up to this hash table, and this hash table ends up being 2 gigs in size? Well, I need to be able to accommodate that and have, have my hash table spill to disk because, again, I want to have the illusion that I have more memory than, than I actually do. So in the same way that we built the buffer pool manager to manage the, you know, the, the bring pages in as we're doing scans and so forth, we're going to use the buffer manager again, the same thing you built for project one, to spill intermediate results to like temp data on disk, right? 
And because of this, because we, we could be end up going to disk if necessary, that means that our implementation is typically going to prefer algorithms, again, that are, that are going to maximize the amount of SwunchGo I.O. Uh, and minimize the amount of random I.O. Because again, doing random disk seeks is more expensive than reading much of uh, you know, stride of data that all contiguous with each other, right? So again, we don't want the OS to manage the memory for us. We're going to do it ourselves. And, there, and because we know that we're the ones managing memory, we'll choose algorithms that can maximize this sequential I.O. So one of the, the, the backbones of the fundamental algorithm we're going to use for a lot of these different operators is sorting. All right, recall that when we talked about the relational model at the very beginning of the semester, we said that the, it's inherently in, unsorted. Right? It's based on set algebra. Right? It's an unordered set, an unordered collection of data uh, without any duplicates. In relational systems, and the actual implementation of these systems can be bag algebra, where it is still unordered, but there can be duplicates. And so we'll have to see how we can use sorting to, to, do, to remove the unnecessary duplicates as needed. So obviously, there will be some applications that are going to want data to be sorted. Like if there's a nice order by clause in our select statement, then we need to be able to sort of data to handle that. But at other times also too, even though that the, the, the query is not asking for our data to be explicitly sorted through an order by clause, some of these algorithms we're going to use, like for aggregations and joins we'll see next class, will actually be faster if we sort things ahead of time, then do whatever is the operation that we want to do. But this seems kind of crazy that I want to do a bunch of uh, extra work to sort this thing, uh, knowing that I might still spell a disk. But then when I actually do the, whatever the processing I need for that given operator, because it's sorted, that's going to make my life a lot easier. So it's worth to pay that upfront cost to get the benefits later on. In some cases, uh, in some systems, like a SQL Server, for example, uh, when we will see how to do sorting with external merge sort, like in SQL Server, it can say, hey, this data would be great if it was sorted. And if I had an index, so it'll build you a B plus tree, they call it a spooling index. They'll build a B plus tree just for your query, do whatever it is the operator wants to do to process the data, and then immediately throw it away. Right? And again, this seems crazy, but again, the, 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 the construction cost of that, of that data structure, or the, the construction cost of sorting the data ahead of time, will maximize the amount of sequential I.O. we have later on. And that's going to make our life a lot easier. Right? So as, again, as I said, we need to account for the fact that we may have to spill the disk. If everything can fit in memory, well, that's easy, right? Pick whatever your favorite sorting algorithm you learned in, in you know, like early CS classes, right? Merge sort, quick sort, Tim sort, uh, gnome sort, cocktail shaker, shaker sort. You know, if you look at the Wikipedia pages, there's a bunch of them. Uh, in general, quick sort and Tim sort are probably the best, the best two that you want. So if everything's in memory, our life is easy. We just use whatever you learned in, again, in early CS classes to sort things. It's when you have to spill a disk, that's the challenge that we're, that we're trying to overcome today, right? That we need to account for that we may have to read the data in and we can't bring it all of it in. And how can we divide up the problem so that we can still get a globally sorted data that doesn't fit entirely in main memory? So most database systems are going to use quick sort. Uh, or uh, variations of this, or insertion sort sometimes, or everything fits in memory. Like Postgres will use quick sort. And if you look at the query plan, it'll tell you that it's using quick sort, right? Because if it fits everything in memory. And then obviously, if you're, you know, how would you know that you can use quick sort versus a sort of merge sort or the disk based sorting? Well, you make, you make an estimation about how much data you think you're going to need coming up the query plan, right? Coming up between the different operators and decide, oh, well, the data is this size. I have this amount of memory in my, my buffer pool to sort it. Therefore, I can use quick sort. And if you get it wrong, then you can just stop and, and revert back to, uh, to use, to use uh, you know, a disk-based sorting. Postgres can't do that. Other systems can. If you recognize you get it wrong, you adapt your query plan and change it. Right? But we, we, we'll ignore that for now. All right, so today we're going to talk again about the two basic sorting algorithms that we're going to care about the most in, in, in a, in a disk-oriented database system. Top end, sort, top end heap sort is a special case. When, when you know what the query actually is want, wants, and therefore you don't have to do a sort, you don't have to sort everything. And then external merge sort would be the, the core algorithm we'll use to do disk based sorting. And then we'll see then how we can use that sort of data to then do aggregations and then also compare it against hashing, which will then segue us into how to do joins next class. And then we'll finish up with a uh, guest lecture, a guest talk from uh, DBT, which is a very 
interesting tool. Uh, you, you may have never heard of it, but it's widely used everywhere. Pretty, pretty much every single company in the world is using DBT. Um, and the reason why you may have heard of it because you don't have, you guys are students, you don't have any data. When you start getting data at your startup or your, your company, whatever it is, then you realize what you need DBT for. But uh, Drew will give a talk and, and explain why. Okay, so as I said, top end heap sort is a special case where if you have a query with an order by clause with a limit, then you know, that the, the data system knows that it doesn't need to globally sort everything. It just needs to get whatever the subset is for the, 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 the greatest or the smallest values based on what the order by clause is. So in this case here, my query is getting all the student IDs, or getting all the, the, the student records from the enroll table, ordering them based on the student ID in ascending order. Uh, but then now we're adding this fetch first four rows with ties clause. We didn't talk about limits, but this basically says order by the student ID, but give me the first four values, uh, that are the, the top values for that sort, uh, sorting. And then with ties specifies whether you want to include the, the records with ties or not. So the way you would do this is that, assume you have this original data, and for simplicity reasons, I'm showing as, as a single column like this, all contiguous data. But you basically allocate a, a, a sort of heap data structure, like a priority queue or some, something, something pretty simple. Um, and the idea is that as you scan along the original data, you just insert into the sort of heap if you have a free space, or if there isn't, meaning like they're all occupied, then you check to see whether the value that you're looking at is greater than the, the, the highest value in my sorted heap. If yes, in this case, because I want things in ascending order, then I know I, I just ignore it. Right? So in this case here, the first thing we land on is three. Our sorted heap is empty, so we put it in the front. Then we land on four. We have an extra spot. We put it after three like that. Six goes there. Two, two, goes, two is less than three, so we just slide everybody over, and then now we, we can fill in two. And now we come across nine. Nine is greater than six, so we know that because they're only asking for the four top values, this query never needs to look at nine, so we just ignore it and skip it and keep going. Then we get to one. In this case here, our sorted heap is full, so we just slide everybody over, drop six, make a free space for one, insert one. Now we see four. Now we already have a four in there, so we have to recognize that, but then again, they, they're asking for ties, so we just add a little bit more, more memory to the end of this to start putting in additional things. And obviously we have to keep track of like, are we going past the original four because we have ties? Or are we, you know, are we, are we not just adding things because we think we have more space? So keep scanning down, in this case four, we add it again, we find the eight, we know we don't need it, we skip it and we're done. Right, the advantage of this approach is that it's one pass over the data and I didn't actually have to sort anything. Right, I had my little, my, my little sort of buffer uh, heap on the side and I just used that to fill in the, the data that I need. I didn't have to do the quick sort pivots or anything like that. It was one pass over the data. And this, this would be super fast. Uh, well, if your data is petabytes, and you know, that's going to be a problem. But like, uh, you know, having, doing one pass over an hour over data is always going to be a huge win. So most, most of the high-end systems do this. Postgres do th does this. I don't know whether MySQL does. And I think DuckDB can do, do this as well. Right, because this is such a clear win. And this, like, give me the top 10 elements uh, based on some ranking is, is, is a pretty common thing. Right, think of like a leaderboard like in this class or like any kind of like online game, give me the top 10 players, that's gonna run this algorithm. Okay, so also in this case too, like, because I'm doing one pass over the original data, I just have, you know, I can have one buffer pool frame, just use that to fetch in something, scan it, throw it away, and then get the, get the next thing. I can do prefetching and other, other, op other optimization tricks we talked about before, but like, I really only need one buffer for the, the data I'm reading and then another buffer or so for my, my heap. All right, so what if we have to do a more general sor sorting? And again, everything doesn't fit in disk. Uh, then we're going to rely on what is called external merge sort. And again, most database systems are, are going to be able to support this because otherwise, if you try to sort data that, and you can't spill to disk, you're gonna run out of memory, or if you start using quick sort, uh, it's gonna be really, really slow, because that's gonna be a bunch of random IO. So external merge sort is gonna be a divide and conquer approach where we're gonna split up the data that we need to sort into smaller units called runs. And the idea is that we're gonna sort those runs by, in memory, and then write them out the disk to make room for the next things we need to sort, 
And then we're going to do this through multiple rounds or multiple, multiple passes until we end up with a globally sorted uh, uh, complete, complete data set. So what's going to be confusing is that what I'm describing today is the external merge sort algorithm. We're also going to use this algorithm next class when we talk about the merge sort. So in your merge sort algorithm for the sort phase, you can use external merge sort, uh, which has its own separate sorting and merging phases. So for now, we, we can ignore that. But next class, I'll try to be very careful to say, like, what's the external merge sort versus what's the, the sort merge? Um, all right, so again, the first pass, we're going to get sort chunks of data that fit into memory and then write the sorted chunks back out the disk. And then the second pass, we'll read those sorted runs back in uh, and then just merge them together and produce more larger runs, write those back out, and keep doing this until we've sorted everything. All right, so let's see what this, oh, actually, before we get to that, let's, let's, let's first talk about okay, what, are, what are we actually going to restore uh, in these buffers or these pages as, as we're sorting? So you can sort of think of what we need to sort is, is a combination of key value pairs, right? The key is going to be whatever, whatever's in the order by clause or whatever it is that we're asking, uh, being asked to sort. And then the value could either be the, the tuple, the record that we actually need to sort, or the uh, record ID. Right? So again, and, and the way to think about this is when you actually want to materialize the final result that you need to again, give back to, uh, to the client or the application that executed the query. And so the way to think about this is, is, is the notion between early materialization and late materialization. In early materialization, the idea is that as I'm sorting the data, I have the full tuple, tu full tuple that corresponds to the key that I'm actually sorting on. So that I don't have to go back on up when I go up the further query plan, I don't have to go back to the original data and get the rest of the tuple. In the case of late materialization, you just have a record ID, right? And what happens there is I can do all the sorting I need just based on the keys, because that's all the information I need. But then later on in the query plan, if I have to do anything else that needs the rest of the tuple, I have to go then fetch that from disk. Right? So say like if I have a billion tuples uh, and I have a filter where I remove 99% of them, and then only then I sort it, and then I go. We need to go back and get the rest of the data. In that case, uh, late materialization is going to be a big win because I threw. I didn't have to copy a bunch of data around that I didn't end up actually needing, which is going to be one of the ultimate goals we have. You know, when we try to optimize queries. But in the case of uh, if if I didn't filter out all those 99% you know, of the tuples, then after I do my sorting, uh, or after I do my, my filter and then my sorting. Then I got to go back and fetch all that data again, which might be more, much more, you know, squinch. So I basically have to read the data twice. So that would suck. Um, so there's not, and you know, depending on the workload, depending on the data, depending on the query, one of these approaches might be better than another. If you're building a row store system, you typically do early materialization because you go fetch the page and all the data you need is right there. In the column store system, some of them will actually try to do late materialization, but in some cases you you, you don't actually want to do this. We'll cover this more when we when we. Um, we talk about query execution. I just be mindful that like I'm going to show these algorithms in terms of just like, hey, here's the key, and we're done. But actually, it's the key plus the value, and that value it could be actually quite large. Yes. So what happens if we sort by like two keys? One is like the primary, and like the, the primary is the same. We sort by the secondary key. Do we use the early materialization but have two keys, or uh, but just because? Oh, sorry. Do we use the early materialization because we can just look for primary and secondary key within that tuple, or? Do we use late materialization but keep two keys? Yeah, the question is if I'm, is it, yeah, so you're doing sorting based on the primary key. Like uh, primary first, then secondary. Like an order by clause has two, has two yeah. co okay. And the question is do you, I, you do what, sorry? Do, uh, do, do both early, early materialization or late materialization work for like multiple keys? I know early materialization for sure works because you can just look up the other keys in the tuple, but. For late materialization, do we yeah, yeah. multiple keys? Right. So our question is, say, let's ignore the, actually the indexes, because the, the answer is the same, right? The question is, like, if I'm sorting based on two keys, and say the first key is the primary key, um, could you use an, if you have a B plus tree, could you just do that sorting on the primary key and then do additional sorting based on the, the additional key afterwards? Uh, depends on whether the data is actually sorted, a cluster based on that primary key. We'll see later on. Typically, though, you want to get you need to get both of the keys and try to do the sorting all together. So you would sort of materialize the key you want to sort on, and then look at that. And whether or not you go get the rest of the tuple depends on when you're, you're doing these two different approaches. 
I don't know if any system can do... I think what you're originally proposing is like you're using two different indexes to sort at the same time. I don't think you can do that. Okay. So let's use a uh, let's use sort of a simplified example of the external merge sort. We'll do what is called a two-way two-way external merge sort. And then in this case, the number two corresponds to the the number of runs I'm going to bring in, into memory and merge together to produce a new sorted run. Right. So if you did like a three-way merge sort, you could bring in uh, you could bring in three pages and merge them together. Yes. Yes. His question is, with late materialization, do I only bring the keys in to memory and sort them? I mean, yes, but I, it might, just the key value pairs are like the key and the record ID. Even that might be really huge and I have to spill it a disk. The idea is that I'm not copying around the, the, the rest of the tuple data as I'm you know, putting things into sorted runs and, and so forth. Again, think of like when you implemented quick sort in like you know, CS101, you just given a bunch of numbers and you, you have to you know, sort them. But it's actually, you know, it's a, it's a key value pair. It's like there's a payload you have to actually copy around as well. So when you start doing the, the, the pivots and moving things around, you've got to copy that payload as well. Okay. All right, so we're going to do two, uh, two ways, sort of merge sort. Uh, we're going to assume that in this case here, the data is going to be broken up into n pages. And then now we have to specify that we ha how many buffer uh, pool pages or frames we're going to be allowed to use to do our sorting. Because right, we can't assume we have infinite amount of memory. We have to be told how much memory we're allowed to use. And for simplicity, we, you know, we can assume that in this example here, we, just, you know, we have you know, we'll use three pages, right? Uh, three, three, three buffer pages, the, the, the simplistic one. But in a real system, you obviously want to use as much memory as you can to do the sorting, because then you, there'd be fewer passes going back, back and forth to disk. But if you're running other queries at the same time, you don't want the one query that's doing sorting to slow down and, and trash your buffer pool for everyone else. So typically, there's a knob or a parameter you can set to say how much memory you're allowed to use for, for sorting for any particular query. Right? And you, you can change it on a per query basis, but there's, usually there's, there's a global value, global value you set. All right, so in the first pass, pass zero, all we're going to do is just read one page of, of, from the table in memory at a time, sort it uh, to create this new run, and just write that back out to disk. All right? And we'll repeat this for every single page in our table until they're all, all sorted. Then in the subsequent passes, uh, we're going to recursively merge those, those pairs of runs that are contiguous to each other, uh, bring them in, sort of have a cursor iterate through them, compare values, and then write out to a new output buffer uh, the, sort of, the values in that sort of order. And we do this for all the sort of runs we have, and once we're done, then we go back and re repeat the process over and over again until we end up with a single run that has all the data sorted. Yes? Can you keep telling sort out? Because like past zero seems kind of independent of each other. Yes, her statement, and she's correct, can this be done in parallel because past zero is independent? Yes. But for, for simplicity, I mean, I'm not even really talking about workers or threads here, but yes, you're good. Yes? Yes, so his question is, he's correct. Do you need to allocate a new disk page to sort of the, the, the sort of run? Yes. So you would have like a temp page that's, that's still be backed by the buffer pool, but like it's like a scratch base. But then I can deallocate it once I know I'm not going to need that run anymore. Right? So like if you're stupid about it, you, you would need three copies. You, you need uh, three times the number of uh, pages of the original table size because I would have you know, the, the sorted page and the new output page and the original data. Right, but you can throw away pages. You throw away runs from pages. You, pages for runs you, once you once you merge them. So that typically won't cause a storage problem. So it, you you said typically it won't cause a storage cause a storage problem. Yeah, like, like what do you mean? By, what do you mean by storage problem? Like if I need to sort a really large table, then I need to I need double the size of the table in my queue. So question: If I need to sort a really large table, do I need double size of the disk? Yes. Okay. But this is like, what's the alternative? Right, you try to sort in place, it'd be, it'd be super slow. Right? Disk is cheap now, right? And I'm serious, like it's, uh, you know, it's, it may not be fast, right? NVMe is getting much, much faster, but like it's, oh, I, I forget what the price per gigabyte is, it's nothing. Right? And so if you go to S3, it's nothing. At least to get it once. 
All right, so let's walk through an example. So uh, again, we're doing two-way two -way, uh, external MERS sort. So at the very beginning, we just have our original data. And assuming here, I'm just drawing uh, in each, each page, there's two values, right, or two keys. And I'm not showing what the, what the values are, whether it's record ID or, or the actual tuple data. Again, for this visualization, it doesn't matter. So again, in, the, in pass zero, we're just going to scan through, read every page in, and then just sort the two keys that are inside that page. All right? So then at the beginning of page one, I have now uh, 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 runs of size, size one, of one page. So now, what I'm going to do is, uh, in, in, to produce the output of the, the, second, the next pass, I'm going to take two contiguous pages. Again, locally, each page is sorted within the keys that they have. But across the two pages themselves, they're not, they're not globally sorted. So I'm going to take these two guys here. And I'll allocate one output buffer for me to write data into. Right? So I have to bring these two, two, two pages in. I have an output buffer to write some data out. Right? And then now I just have a cursor that's just going to scan through them sequentially. And to, whatever the cursor is looking at in the first page and whatever the cursor is looking at in the other page, compare them. Whatever one, whatever one is less, that get, gets written out. And then the one that I put in there, that cursor moves, moves ahead by one. Now I do the same thing, compare the two values or two keys that that cursor is pointing to, write out whatever one is the smallest, iterate that cursor. And now that my, my, this page here with the two and the six, that's full. I write that out the disk, out, you know, reuse the memory now to, for new output buffer to continue the rest of the, the, the merging of the two runs. So again, I only need, in this example here, I only needed three pages, two for the input, one for the output. So I can just now then just go do that for one by one for all the other ones. In the case of the, of the last, the last uh, page over here, it didn't have two, two pages. It only had one. Uh, so I could be smart and say, I don't have to bring that in just to write it back out. I could say, oh, this thing is already locally sorted. I don't need to merge with anything else. And just carry it over to the next, next phase, next pass. And then now I'll do the same thing the next pass, right? I'll bring in from the, sort of the first set over here, I'll bring in the first page, the two, three, and the second page, four, seven, have my cursor uh, scan through and look at them, compare values, and write them out to, uh, to, to the output, new output pages. And then now within that run of size four, the, the data is locally sorted. And I keep recursively doing this until I end up at the bottom with now a, lo a, a globally, sorted, uh, globally sorted data set. Yes? This question is, are these all in memory? Um, no, so going, going back here. So at this point here, I only have, uh, I don't, do I have a pointer? I have a pointer. And you can't see it. I have the page where it says 3, 4, where the arrow is pointing to, and I have the page where 2, 6 is, and where that's pointing to. And then I have this output page. Everything else is out on disk, right? So then now, once this thing gets full, right, at this point here, then I write out the 2, 3 page. Reuse the memory now for this next one to, to fill in four six, and then when that's done, I do that again that incrementally for all, all the other uh, uh, run pairs until I produce uh, run of size two. So the number of passes here is going to be uh, one plus log two n. The plus one is that first pass zero where I have to again make my small little uh, you know small runs of size one. And the log 2n is almost like, again, like the, uh, you know, it's like traversing the B plus tree, where I'm cutting down by half the number of things I have to look at or number of passes I need as you go down. So the total I.O. cost of, of sorting this data is 2, 2n, where n is the number of keys I need to sort, uh, and then times the number of passes as I go down. So this obviously would, would, be, would suck to have like, you know, log 2n, again, typically in algorithms class, that sounds great, log, you know, log, two bit, you know, log 2n, that's great. But then think of like, I have a billion pages, right? That log 2n is, is not going to be that great. So the way to make this even better is we want to change this too to a larger value, because that means we can, we can bring in more, more, more pages into memory at a time and have larger sorted runs. So we don't have to go through so, so many passes. Right? So again, in my example here, the number of bufferable pages we need is three because it's you know, two for the inputs, one for the output. 
But if we have more space available, then you know, we, we can try to do more things that you bring more things in at the same time. But if we just do the, the naive example where I showed before, where we just sequentially or with a single worker thread, go look at sort of one run at a time, then it's not going to be that fast. So we, there, there are some tricks to optimize that. We'll see it in a second. So in general, the, 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 for a sort of general M ways sorting algorithm, it's going to be have B buffer pools. And we take the ceiling of n divided by b, because again, that's because we could have pages at the end that don't uh, don't easily or equally fill up uh, all the possible runs we could have within that last sec uh, section. And then in the subsequent passes, we just need to bring in uh, b minus one pages into memory because we always need one one page as output, right? And then the, it's plug and chug on the total number of passes to get the total I/O cost for this as well. Pretty clever, right? Like this is uh, this divide and conquer approach is widely used in databases and, and other systems because it's breaking the problem out to, to smaller chunks, and then making so that each each sort of chunk of the problem is is manageable. Yes. So let's say we have like two output pages. In that case, like when the first one gets full, you can send it to disk, and you can use the second one to keep continuing doing the merge. Like wouldn't that? Be yes. So he's saying, what if you had two output pages? Couldn't you then basically interleave I/O? It's called double buffering. Two more slides. Yes. Is this faster than just doing the two-way merge in parallel? Because you could still use all the buffer pool pages that way. This question is, is this still faster than doing a two-way merge in parallel? Uh, because you could still use all the buffer pool. Um, I mean, so your question is, like, should I still have, like, could I have multiple threads doing two-way at the same time? Um, the challenge with that one is going to be if you have, well, in the old days, you would not want to do that because you couldn't have so many parallel requests to the disk. Nowadays, the disk queues are actually quite large, so you could eventually do that. But it, it, in general, it ends up being the same. Actually, no, in that case, you would end up writing, you still have to, if, you're, if you do what you're proposing, you're, you're still going to have a, a large number of passes. So you may be reading and writing it out over and over again. Versus if I use a bunch of memory, I use all my memory to just sort things I'm, it's fewer passes, like the tree gets shrunk. So that, that, I think that's going to be always better to do, even, even if you have parallel I.O. Yes? So just to clarify, for B buffer pages, we are merging B minus 1 runs and using the last page as a merge result. Right? Yes. So but the merge result will for sure be bigger than the runs. So what if we run, like, one page is not good enough for holding, like, the merge? Of, of the output? That's fine, right? Again, going back here. When I was here, again, I had my output page when I'm putting two. I put in three. It's full. Write that out and just reuse the memory. And then for the, for the next one, right? Because again, I, I, like, as I'm doing the merge, I don't have to go back and look at the page, at the output page I just wrote. So that's why I can, I can write it out and, re, and reuse the memory. OK, so look how the math works out going through this example here. So say that we want to sort some data, uh, and we have 108 pages with five buffer pool pages. So n equals 108, b equals 5. So in pass 0, again, we take the ceiling of n divided by 5, because we're going to break it up into uh, to, to sort of runs of, of five pages each. So we end up with 22. right? And the last run has a remainder. It's only, it's only, uh, it's only three pages. Then in the subsequent pass, again, now we're going to be sorting together, or putting together pages of, of five pages. So since we have four pages we can bring to memory, we're going to end up producing output runs of size 20 pages. Right? So we're multiplying the, the size of the sorted run is multiplied by four as, as we're going down. Then the subsequent pass, we end up with uh, getting down to, to 80 pages with, with, uh, with only two sorted runs. Then in the final pass, we end up with the, the completed sorted run of 180 pages. And then the, the, the formula works out like this. So then in this case here, we, it only took four passes. Again, 108 pages is nothing. Think if you have, you know, uh, you know a, a billion records, like petabyte of data. This, you know, this algorithm is still going to work in that case. So the exact details of like, you know, uh, you know can you do asynchronous I/O to write things out in the background while you're reading other things? All that's going to depend on the hardware. All that's going to depend on what uh, what the system actually implements, right? How much memory you should use, allocate for a query, depends on what else is running in the system. So it's not like these values. There's not like like 
there's not going to give you values for n and b that would be optimal for any possible situation. Right? The answer is it always depends on databases. So now, the optimization that he brought up, and he's correct, is that the, the problem with, this, with the sort of general algorithm that I showed is, is you basically have this phase where you're reading things in or writing things out. Right? And as we talked about before, disk writes are going to be slow. Right? Worst case scenario, you know, tens of milliseconds. Of, if you're going to S3, hundreds of milliseconds. Um, but even then, your CPU is blocked waiting for the, the next batch of things you have to go read in. So a better, a better approach is to basically divide your memory into half, where you have half the buffer is being used to sort some data you have in memory right now, and then the other half is being used to fetch the next things uh, that I'm going to need. And then you're basically alternating back and forth of what, of, of, you know, what sort of phase is writing, writing things out, or what, which of the sets of buffers are writing data out. Right? So this would be nice because it can reduce the time you have to wait for I.O. because the system is always going to be able to have something to do, some, some work to be done because data will be in memory. So you can think of like a really simple example. Like say this is our buffer pool, and we have basically three pages, and we have one page for the output buffer. So if we do the basic algorithm I showed before, we bring the first set of pages in, sort them into our output buffer, and write that out to disk. Then when that's done, we can then go ahead and get and fetch, fetch the next pages. Right? Again, that disk write might take a long time, so that would be slow. So instead, if we have the double number of, of memory, uh, we need for the inputs and for the output buffer that we can have uh, the system again fetch data in like we did before, merge that out. But while it's doing that disk write, we're going and fetching the other data for the next the next sort of round, bringing that into memory, and then sorting that and writing that out as well. And you just, again, you're ping ponging your alternating back and forth to keep the system always running and doing useful work. So all this this reduces your effective I/O or sort of effective memory that you have available by half. If your disk is really slow, then this is going to be a, a huge win because you're, you're hiding the, that, that disk call by still doing useful work. And this is why you'd want to use a, a, you know, a disk manager with non-blocking I.O. So you can say, here's the data I want you to write out and have whatever thread do that right for you. Then you can go, go have your worker thread go process more data. If you're relying on a, like an OS syscall to do that, like the OS syscall is going to be blocking. So you don't want your main worker thread to be blocked on the, on the, on the operating system while it's doing the right, the flush. You want it to be doing other things. Yes? Can you do something like triple buffering? Can you do triple buffering? Sure, yes. But some of you run out of memory. Is this technique used in practice? Is this technique used in Yes. Um, is it commonly used? Is it commonly used? I, I, I don't know. I think, I think Postgres does this. I don't know about MySQL and others. Again, if your disk is like super fast, then like it's less it's less helpful. Okay, so one usual thing we didn't really talk about, uh, or, or another way to optimize this is the thing you wouldn't really think would be, would, would be an issue, and that is actually comparing the keys can be expensive. Again, just going back to like CS101, when you first implement QuickSort, you're taking two 32-bit 30 30 numbers and just going, you know, comparing less than and greater than. That's a single instruction in the CPU. That's fast. But data isn't always going to be you know, fixed, fixed length values. And so you want a way to, to, to optimize that comparison because you can be doing a lot of that for a really big data set. And then you wanna, don't want to have to re-implement your sorting algorithm over and over again uh, to have all these different variations of, of possible data types. So instead, what often happens is that when you call your sort method or sort operator in your database system, you also pass a, a pointer to, to the comparison function. Now what happens then? When, when, I'm, when my system's running, I gotta do a jump call to go to my comparison function to do the, you know, compare the less than greater than to then return back zero one 1 as accordingly. That jump call is gonna be expensive on modern CPUs if you're doing this again for a billion times. So there's some, uh, Two ways to make this go better, go faster, is one through code specialization. We'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about query execution uh, after, the, after the fall break. But the idea here is that instead of having this general purpose sorting algorithm where you have it pass the function pointer and then make the call to the function to say do the comparison, it's better off to inline or hard code that comparison operator based on the type. So then now it's just all inline uh, when I do my comparison and I'm not making that jump call. 
So if I know I'm going to be comparing two floating point numbers, I could have that floating point instructions directly inside my, my sorting algorithm. So there's a couple of different ways you can cogen this. You can do this as at, like, at, um, at runtime, based on the data type, cogen the, the sorting algorithm with, with the inline function. Right? Or you can do this at compile time. And this is what Postgres does. It's a bit of a hack, but it works. They have a Perl script that takes their sort, sorting algorithm implementation and just duplicates it and makes multiple versions of it, one for integers, one for floats, one for whatever. So the ink now compiled in the, in the system, they'll have the different flavors or variants, if you will, of the, of, the, uh, of the comparison function. Again, think of like templating in C++, but Postgres is written in C, so that's why they're duplicating the code. So then at runtime, I know what data type I have that I need to compare when I do my sort, and I make sure I call the sorting algorithm that has, that has the hard-coded comparison for that data type. And now there's less indirection. There's not this, this, this jump to the, the comparison operator. Another trick we can do for really long uh, var chars or strings is similar to what we saw when we talked about B plus trees, where instead of having to compare the entire, uh, entire string to see whether there's a match, and maybe pass that data around, I instead could just lop off the, a, a prefix of the key, sort based on that, and then have that in line be really fast, where I maybe have to look at the first three characters of, of a really long string. And that's enough for me to figure out whether I want to go left or right as I'm sorting things. And then if, if, the, if, the, prefix, or sorry, if the, the prefixes are, are equivalent, you still have the way to back out and call the actual full comparison operator or comparison uh, function. I don't know what uh, systems do this. Uh, this. This typically mostly appears in maybe some of the, the, the commercial systems. Or so the, for, for OLAP stuff. OK. So she brought up the question of like, OK, what if I had the primary key or secondary index? Uh, can I use that to make sorting go faster? The answer is yes. If you, if you have a index, a B, an order preserving index like a B plus tree, that's already on the keys that you want to sort in your order by clause, then it doesn't make sense to sort that, again, because it's already sorted for you. Um, some systems like Postgres can do this, but they have to have an exact match. Like if I have my, my, my order by clause is on, is on uh, columns A and B, I have to have an index on, on A and B in order to, to, to use it. In Oracle and the enterprise systems, if my order by clause is on A and I have an index on A, B, I can still use that index because I know the A values are going to be sorted correctly or in the order that I want. But Postgres, again, as far as I know, has to have an exact match. So now I begin to get the data we need in sorted order. It's just a matter of jumping to some point in the tree, scanning along leaf nodes, and we get back the data I want. But depending on whether the data is clustered or unclustered, based on that index, this could be a good idea or a bad idea. Just as a reminder, when we talk about clustered, clustered uh, indexes, the idea is that the, 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 the pages where the tuples actually being stored are in the same order as they, as, as they, as they exist in the leaf nodes of the, of the index. Right? So now, again, if I want to go get all the sorted data, I just sequentially scan along the leaf nodes, get all the pointers to jump to the data I need, and again, I don't have to do any additional sorting. It's already sorted for me. Right? That's easy to do. That's really fast. If it's unclustered, uh, then we, it's a problem we talked about before where I may end up doing a bunch of random I.O. for fetching pages in out of order and having to go thrash and bring them, out to, bring them into memory, throw them back out, and read them back again uh, if I'm not careful about this. So for top end queries where I only need to get the, the, the you know, certain number of values across the data set, then this is probably OK because you know, the, end, the number of records I need should be a subset or much less than the total number of records that exist. So I can maybe just jump to one side of the tree, scan the first couple of uh, first keys that I need, and go fetch those pages. And again, different systems will do different things. Uh, if it's index organized uh, storage, where the leaf nodes actually store the data itself, then this, this is, is, isn't an issue. Again, assuming that the order by clause is based on the, 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 the key that this thing is sorted on. Yes? Especially, it's like it's good for top end queries because if it's small enough, then it's small enough pages. Yeah, so like if I only need to get the top ten things, uh, so assuming that this is in uh, say descending order, right? So that the highest value is going to be on this side. I jump to that side of the the, the tree, you know, traverse down, and then scan along leaf nodes and get the ten things I want, 
and then go fetch those 10 pages. Versus like if we did the, the, the top end heap sort, I got to scan all the pages because I, I don't know where it's actually going to be stored. Right? Even though that's one pass and better than sort of merge sort, going get the index and getting exactly the minimum number of pages I need is always going to be better. Yes? Is there a case that we actually want to use on cluster B plus three? Because this seems like a bunch of random IOs to me. The question is, is there any case you would actually would, would on cluster B plus three for sorting? No, like for anything. For anything? Compared to cluster B plus three. Uh, so the question is, like, the question is, when would you ever want to use on cluster B plus three? Most systems use on cluster B plus trees, right? For index organized storage, like MySQL and I think SQL, SQL Server can do this, or no, SQLite, like the, the leaf nodes are at the data itself, right? So this is not an issue. In, in other systems like SQL Server, you can say, I want this, or an Oracle to, I want this thing to be sorted based on the, on the, uh, you know, on the index. In Postgres, you can call the cluster command and it'll sort all your data, but it's not guaranteed to be synchronized. So it'll do one, it'll do, it'll do external merge sort to sort all the data, basically rewrite the tables. And then over time, if you update things, it could get out of order. But the idea is that first pass kind of keeps things, uh, get things sorted, at least initially. And we haven't really talked about this. There's, if there are tricks you can do. If you know the data is semi-sorted, then there's some, some, you know, some tricks you can do. Say, OK, I, I, I know that it's sorted enough, and therefore I, I, you know, I, I may have to look at less data than I actually need to. But mo most of the indexes, when you when call create index, will not be a clustered index. Is, is, the question is, is it because the B plus tree is only used temporarily? Yeah. Uh, if I call create index, it's not temporary. Like, so you I mean, maybe you're asking why aren't, why isn't everybody doing a clustered, in, clustered index and why isn't everybody using index organized storage? Right? I mean, it's a design choice of when you built the system, whether you want to do that or not, based on what you think the, the workload should be. Right? So Postgres was invented in 1984. Uh, I don't know whether index organized. I don't, I don't know whether the idea of storing data in the leaf nodes was, was even a thing back then. MySQL, first order of MySQL didn't do that. It's only InnoDB did that. That came around like 99. SQLite is 2001. So it might, it's a, it's a semi-newer technique. But to your point, if you have a bunch of, like, the idea is that you have the heap pages or the, the, where the tuples are, that's unsorted, and then I can build whatever in indexes I want, right? And that might change over time. I might say, okay, I'm, most of my queries need to be data sorted in this way, so I'll build an index for that. And then over time, it maybe becomes another column becomes more important, and you want to build an index on that. And again, that's the great thing with relational model SQL is that you can make that change without having to maybe throw things, everything away. The index organized storage kind of, kind of, uh, Makes it more obvious the or exposes to more to you about the underlying storage mechanisms of the of the data because now you know it's going to be sorted based on the whatever you specify as the primary key for the clustered index. But that's that's, that's more philosophical, of like whether you want to design your system to do that or not. Oracle and SQL Server will give you the choice. Like you can do things unsorted, uh, you can have un, un, unsorted heap pages, or you can have index organized pages. You can specify on a per table basis which one you want to use. MySQL with InnoDB always does uh, index organized storage. All right. So now we talk about aggregations. Again, sorting is going to be a backbone. Uh, it'll be one potential way we can implement aggregations, but hashing is going to be the other one. And we'll focus more on hashing uh, techniques next class. All right. And this is like a, you know, the, the, the bloods with the crypts, like this is a classic trade-off between these, these rival approaches to like making your, your data system fast, right? Sometimes sorting algorithms would be better, sometimes hashing algorithms would be better. And then if you look at the, the, liter the research literature over the last couple of decades, sorting was faster, then Harvard got better, then, Harvard, then hashing got faster, and then like the algorithms got better for sorting. So sort like it goes back and forth. But in general now, nowadays, the, the hashing is almost always going to be better. But we'll see this next class. There may be some times where the, 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 the query has an order by clause. It needs the data to be sorted. And just so happens that if you sort the data uh, once, with the, then you can do your aggregation very, very quickly without having to do the hashing technique. Right? Like the byproduct of like getting the data sorted so you can do your aggregation ends up satisfying the order by clause for free. And so you, you get a big win by just doing the, do, doing the two together. But in general, hashing always 
it's almost always going to be better, especially if your disk is going to be slow. All right, so again, we talked about aggregations in lecture two, but the idea was we have some, some collection of data, and we want to do some computation to collapse it down into a single scalar value, like a count, min, max, sum, so forth. And so what we're going to need is, in our system is we need a way to quickly identify that tuples have the same key, like whatever, whatever it is our group by is based on, so that we can put them together to compute whatever aggregation is going to be. So let's start with the most simplest uh, aggregation function, distinct. Right, just give me all the unique values for, for a given column. In this example here, I have the order by on the, on the course ID, and my distinct clause is going to be the course ID. So in this case here, sorting is going to give us, you know, kill two birds with one stone, because we'll get it sorted for the order by, and we use sorting for the, for the distinct. So let's say now we, we do our, our filter based on the where clause, get down the, the, the minimum number of tuples we need, then we do our projection to remove all the columns we actually we don't need. And then now we just sort this using our external merge sort. And then now we just have our, our iterator go through our output of the sorted data, just check to see whatever the, the cursor is pointing at. Is it the same as the last value I just looked at? If yes, I know ahead, I, 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 can, I can go ahead and remove it. And that removes all the duplicates. So that, that's pretty simple, right? Pretty easy. So if we don't need the data to be sorted, uh, then f forming the groups, you know, uh, it may be actually beneficial to use hashing because you can sort of quickly identify where things are and check to see values, whether they're, they're equivalent to whatever you are trying to do, like a distinct or whatever the, the aggregation is going to be. It reduces the, removes the problem of having to do a, maybe a sequential scan to look at all the data to find what you're looking for, especially because, again, if you have to spill the disk, when I'm trying to find the duplicates, if I have a bunch of things that I've had to spell out the disk because I ran out of memory, I don't have to go fetch those things back in to see whether I'm the same or not. So in this scenario, hashing almost always is going to be better. Not, I mean, not almost always, always. Uh, if I don't need to be data to do it. Uh, because I can, again, do the same divide and conquer technique we saw with, with the external inverse sort, where I can break it up to subproblems that I can bring into memory now. Right? A, a small portion of the data I can bring into memory do whatever the computation I need on that, on that data while it's in memory, and I know because of the way hashing works that there isn't going to be a key that I should be looking at that, that I missed that's on some other page that's out on disk. Because if it was equivalent to me and therefore I cared about it, it would have been brought and put in the same bucket that I went into. Right? And this is almost always going to be way cheaper than having to sort things ahead of time. So. The way we're going to do a hashing aggregation, so we're going to first populate a, an ephemeral hash table for the, for the query. That will start putting our keys in, and depending on what the computation is, the value will be like a running total or computing a sum or what, you know, the min max value, course, uh, whatever, whatever it is. And then now as we scan the table, we'll go check that hash table, see whether our key already exists, and if it does, then based on what the aggregation is going to be, we determine what to do. Like if, it, if it's a distinct and our key already exists in this hash table, we just we throw away our key because we know we, there, we, it already exists. So again, just like before, if everything fits in memory, then this is easy to do. I scan through the data once, populate my hash table, and, and I'm done. But again, if the hash table can get quite large, then this, this is going to be a problem. So we want to be able to be smarter, but again, by spilling into disk and doing a divide and conquer approach. And we want to make sure that we minimize the amount of random I.O. and try to maximize the sequential I.O. So this is what external hashing aggregation will do for us. So it's going to have two phases. And the first phase will be a partition phase. We're going to just scan through the data once, hash all the, 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 the tuples we're looking at based on the, you know, the aggregation key, like the group by clause, the key. And then we're going to write it out into unordered buckets. And then if, if that bucket gets full, then we just, we just write that out the disk and use, use another one. So we're going to prepare the data ahead of time by dividing things up into these partitions. And then in the second phase, we'll just bring these partitions in one by one and do whatever it is the computation we need to do to produce our final output. And again, because we've hashed them such that keys that are the same will be in the same bucket, and the keys that, are, that are, aren't the same may not technically be in the same bucket, then we know that there isn't, again, some other bucket we should be looking at to find a match for the, what we need. And this will maximize the amount of so much I.O. we have to do. So again, the, in the first phase, the partition phase, We'll have, we'll have one hash function, h1, to split the tuples up into partitions. And then if the, uh, if the partition gets full, then we just spill it out 
the DS can write it out and then again reuse, reuse the memory. So assuming we have B buffers, we're going to use B minus one buffers for all the partitions we're bringing in. I'm sorry, for, for the output buffers, and then we'll use one buffer for input. And again, obviously you can parallelize this by using more, bu more buffers and so forth. But the basic algorithm is it's the opposite of what we saw with the external merge sort, was I had to have B minus one buffers for the input and then one buffer for the output. This is I use one buffer for the input and then B minus one buffers for the output. Because like in sort of merge sort, the idea was you're you're bringing in uh, you sort of have a fan out of data you're bringing in and you're coalescing down to sort of you know one stride of data. Where this is the opposite. I sort of have one piece of data and I'm I'm fanning it out because I'm because that's what the partition the hashing is doing for me. So going back here. Uh, again, my query now doesn't have the order by clause, so I, would, but, but I want to get this distinct. So in the first pass, I do the filter, and then I remove the columns. And then now, in the first pass of the, the external hash aggregation, I just scan through whatever the data I have here, I run it through my hash function, and then I start filling up these buffers and just writing them out sequentially. And say this guy here, he gets full. Well, I just go ahead and, and write that out the disk and reuse the memory for, for, the next, the next, uh, for any other key that gets hashed into this. And I, I'm not going back at this phase of the algorithm and going looking at whatever I just wrote back out. Once it's out the disk, I'm, I'm done with it until this phase is done. Then now in the second phase, I'm going to bring those, those partitions in, uh, and I'm going to hash them again and write it now to an in-memory hash function or ha hash table. And the idea here is that my hash table is, will be small enough to fit into memory for the, for the, the set of uh, buffers that I'm looking at. And then once I'm done with computing whatever I need for that uh, sort of set of buffers, I can then populate a new hash table after I write it out to the, fin the, the first hash table out to the final result. So again, it's a divide and conquer approach where I'm bringing in the data in, in smaller, smaller chunks. And again, I don't have to go look at other data that's not in the chunks I'm looking at. And so therefore, I, I can compute whatever answer I need just on that data. So meaning once I fill up my hash table and I, I populate it, I know I, I know I don't need it again to ever update anything else because I'm not going to see any of our keys that are hashed into the same, uh, that have, have the same keys in the first hash table. So in the first phase here, again, it's going to bring in all the buckets we have for the, so maybe the first chunks, right, and the B minus one partitions. And now I'm just going to sequentially scan through these, hash them, install whatever the, 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 the key is in my hash table. And again, in this case here, I'm computing distinct, so I don't, there is no value. It's just like, does this key exist or not? Right? It's basically a set. So then I keep scanning along, do the same thing, hash it into there. Then I get down here, hash it into there when I'm done. So now for these B minus one uh, partitions when I'm done, right, I can take whatever exists in my hash table and now produce a portion of my final result that I'm going to send back to the client. Then I can keep continuing for all the other partitions that I have, hash it, fill in, fill in a new hash table, and then when that's done, then I write, you know, it writes the final result out to, uh, to, to, the, um, to the client. Again, whether or not the final result and the hash table merge together, could just, just right? It, in this phase here, again, depending on what aggregation is, I need to quickly do uh, you know, a random I.O., a random lookup into the hash table. So since this, I had the mechanism to go find this, I don't want to actually use the final result as my hash table. But I can just scan through and find all the keys and, and produce my output that way. So this is distinct. Distinct is easy. Does the key exist or not? For the... And for, for other aggregations we'll talk about in a second, like the value portion of this hash table will have additional, additional summarizations as we go along. So what do we do with this? Right? Again, instead of having to do a sequential I.O. to go look at everything, maintain some giant, potentially giant hash table to see whether I have matches, I'm breaking up to smaller problems, uh, smaller chunks of data, and then now I just have a bunch of sequential I.O. to go through the data once I've divided it. Again, going back here, once I finish with this, you know, these, these buckets, I never have to go back and check it again. And because in the first pass I've already hashed them, I know that down here in additional pages there isn't going to be another 15445 because it can't exist because if it did, it would have been hashed in the same location that I did. So there isn't going to be some random thing down here that would cause my aggregation to compute the incorrect result. Yes? Question, like, why, why, why do I have a separate hash table for, like, for this phase and then I th throw it away and make a new one? Yeah. Because I don't need the memory for the first hash table, and it might be large. Right? Yes? Is there, any, is there ever any benefit of having a 
having like multiple rehashing phases so we're like merged? This question is, is there any benefit of having multiple rehashing phases? Yes. So we'll, we'll talk, talk about this uh, next class. But it may be the case that this thing, if, if there's a ton of people in 1545, this thing gets really, really big. Or let's say, not even a bunch of people in 1545, say like a bunch of keys all hash into the same set of buckets. Then what you want to do is another round of, ha of repartitioning where you pick another hash function and hopefully that divides it up further. You just cover recursive hashing. We'll see that next class. If your data is skewed, you'll have that problem and you need to handle that. Okay, so for aggregations, um, again, the, the basic idea is that instead of just having, you know, does the key exist in this, my output hash table, I'll have the, the key point to some, some total or comp computation that, that I'm maintaining to again compute the final ag aggregation that I need. So now, depending on what, what the aggregation function wants, when I do my probe, my hash table, and I find the key that I want, I update this running value that I'm maintaining ac accordingly, as needed. All right, otherwise, if it doesn't exist, then I, then I install it. So going back here, say in this case here, I want to get the, the, the average GPA of students based group by in course ID. So now, again, ignoring how you know, I'm going through this sequentially, but assume this is, and this is all sort of happening uh, you know, one, it, it, one by one, in my hash table now, I'll have the key that, that I'm hashing based on the, the, the group by the course ID, and then the value will depend on what the aggregation is. So in this case here, they want the average. So I'm going to maintain the, the number of keys that I've seen, the count, and then just uh, a running total, the summation. So then when I, when I went and then produced the final output uh, uh, that, you know, that I return back to the client, I just divide that running total divided by the number of records that I've seen, the number of keys that I've seen, and then that produces the average. Min and max is maintaining the highest and lowest I've seen. Right? Sum is just counting things up and counts just in incrementing everything by one. Like all aggregations can be, can be, can be computed in this manner. Okay? But again, the main takeaway here is that hashing is going to be better for us when we have to spell a disk uh, than, 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 than doing sorting because I can still do the divide and conquer, even though it would normally be random I.O., but because I break things up into smaller chunks, I can still get so much I.O. Okay, so next class we're going to talk about joins, but we'll see more again the difference between the benefits of like sorting versus uh, versus hashing into Cox as join. Joins will be super important because it's the most, it's the, where typically data systems are going to be spending most of their time uh, to compute joins, especially for really large tables. So the, just, the optimizations we discussed so far at sorting, like things like chunking I.O. to amortize costs, do the double buffering, a lot of those techniques will also be applicable for us when we do hashing or start, start doing joins and other computations we could potentially want to do in our database system. Okay? Yes. Sorry. For fishbowl hashing with hash, like first we do the first scan and distribute them into the buckets. Um, does it have to be one distinct key per bucket? Uh, so the question is, in phase one of the, the, the partition phase, when I'm doing the, the initial pass, the first hash function, and writing these out, the data out here, does the keys have to be distinct? No. Because again, you, you can have collisions based on your hash function. That's fine. What I really, let's go ahead. Uh, the question is, and then for the second round, can I still have hash collisions? Yes, right? It's the same. This is just a linear probe hash table that we talked about before. Pick whatever your favorite hash, hash table you want, cuckoo hashing, whatever, right? You're still going to have collisions, potentially, and then the, the, the hashing scheme then tells you how to handle the collisions, right? So in my, my example here, yes, I'm showing you that, like, this thing maps exactly where it was, but, like, it could have hashed into this, and I, I know that this thing's occupied, and I scan down and find, you know, find the, the, the first free slot to put my data in. Again, just think of like the, the, the things we've talked about in the previous lectures are the building blocks we use to do more complicated things. So we already know how to handle conflicts in our, in our hash table. It's, it's the same mechanism here. It's not special. Any other questions? Yes. Her question is, where is this final result actually being stored? And as I said, it, it, like, the reason why this, the, this thing can't be this, because this is some giant hash table, right? And I don't want to send back the hash table to the, to the, to the client, because they're not going to know how to deal with that. So where is this thing actually being stored? So you would have to allocate some output buffers 
uh, technically intermediate results. So like, what, think of like in the query plan, every operator would have a little output buffer or start filling stuff in. And then depending on the implementation of the system, you could start sending back results to queries, to the query, or to the app, like as soon as you get something in here, because you know there isn't anything you have to do after that. But most of the times it's, it's like a blocking call. Like so once you have the entire output buffer filled in, then you return all of it. Which means, of course, again, you could run out of memory when you start filling in your output buffer. If you do like, if you do something stupid like select star from table with a billion records, with just getting everything back, then yeah, you, you, it's going to start going slow because it has to start paging as you as you start writing out the the, the buffers over the, the wire protocol. And that's like most systems will have like a, a built-in export functions, so you don't do that. So you can kind of stream things out. Uh, excellent talking about DBT too. All right. This is Drew. He's the co-founder of uh, DBT. As I said, you don't know you need DBT, but you will. Okay? And that's not me pitching. Great it. intro. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. And hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Drew from DBT Labs. I have an iPad and an Apple Pencil, and I'm inclined to use it. So this can be hopefully a fun and quick presentation about DBT. Uh, my contact info is here. would love to hear from you uh, if you're ever interested in chatting. I live in Philadelphia. Um, and I love mentioning this. I did not get into CMU. I did apply. I did not get in. Um, cool. So I want to kind of talk through uh, a story here. And part one of this story is, you know, the promise of analytics and business intelligence. And so the way the story always gets told, if you talk to, you know, honestly, a lot of vendors is you have tons and tons of data sources uh, that represent data about your business. So it's your application logs and your, you know, payment providers and your customer success tools like Oh, people opening tickets, things like that. And so the promise is you can extract and load all of your data from those sources and load them into your cloud data warehouse, your single source of truth. And that will unlock BI and analytics for the entire organization and make everyone super efficient and productive. And it's going to go great. Um, and so this is the promise that, that we often tell people about analytics. The reality is that you get something that looks more like this. Um, so these data sources represent thousands and thousands of tables. Some of them are up to date, some of them are not, like some of them are deprecated. Meanwhile, you have different engineers creating lots and lots of other tables kind of as derived data sets or, or maybe their views. And I kind of make a joke about this here, but it, it's not that much of a joke. Uh, you're going to find a table at some point in your career called something like prod.vw underscore xrf 30 dv 2 underscore underscore John. And it's mission critical for the business. And nobody knows who John is because he stopped working here like 10 years ago. It's powering these mission critical dashboards and reports and operational tasks that are you know critical to the functioning of the business and yet you have no idea how it works you're afraid to touch anything because you might break it and all the people who knew you know what any of this stuff does left a long time ago um and so the the actual computer science term for this is i think an, an f ton of tables is how we refer to that um so there's some real problems here right there's no data lineage we can't tell where data is coming from and so we can't trust it is this up to date? Was this built by someone I think is reputable or someone I think is like not very good at their job or someone who uh, uh, doesn't understand the domain, things like that? There's no data documentation, right? It's just tables in a, in a data warehouse in a database. Um, so you can't reuse any of this stuff. It's hard to build on top of it. You don't know if it's going to change out from under you or be there next week. Um, there's no deployment process for any of this stuff. It just exists in the database. People just create tables and views ad hoc. And so as a result, you know, everyone just develops and prod. And that means that you're going to break stuff in prod, and then you're going to have a hard time undoing it. Um, so really not much in the way of like mature software development um, workflows happening here. And of course, you know, there's no quality assurance when you're editing stuff in prod, uh, except you know, crossing your fingers. That's part of it. So the result there is you break, you break people's dashboards. Um, the CEO hates when that happens, right? And um, finally, kind of the, the root of all this is you get this really fragmented business logic. So if I come back to this image, the logic that defines, you know, information derived from your data is spread out across hundreds or thousands of tables. You can't actually understand the reality of how we calculate a daily active user or a weekly active user because it's spread so far and so wide and, you know, it's far from centralized anywhere. So all in, there's a lot of problems here and they have really meaningful negative impacts for the business or let me say the organization in general. Um, but fortunately, you know, there's a lot of good and well understood solutions here. So the first one is, you know, we think that you should version control your data transformations. So if you're building derived tables, you know, from your your source tables loaded by um, 
loaded in your data warehouse, if you version control those transformations, then it becomes really easy to you know view and change business logic down the line as your organization or business evolves. If you can visualize data lineage, then you can understand how data flows and figure out if you can trust a table. So maybe if I'm looking at uh, a customer satisfaction score metric, I can understand if that's coming out of Zendesk, our customer success tool, or you know a, a, a Google Sheet that we sent out to 47 customers last year. Uh, where's, where's this thing com coming from? Okay, uh, we always recommend using a CI CD process. So this is continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, if you're not familiar, the big idea is that when you you know effectively open a pull request in GitHub or GitLab, something like that, you can test all of your changes and make sure that everything's passing. And then when you merge those changes, they'll be automatically deployed out to production, right? So having automated deployments is a key tenant of a mature software development workflow. We think that data people should work the same way. And one of the big punchlines here is you get to develop in dev, not in prod, which is you know where you should be developing. Automated tests are a huge deal. This helps you find out if your data is broken before your CEO finds out. It's okay to break things as long as you fix them before people find out or if you communicate well, uh, well, well, it's broken. Um, but definitely you don't want to find out that you have a problem because you know the CEO saw it first. That's a bad way to find out. Okay, last, and it's very important to document your data sets, right? You're doing all this work to create derived tables that represent some sort of transformation of data, some sort of business logic rule that you think is important. You should document that so that other people can build on top of your work. And so you can sort of collaborate instead of all, you know, uh, stepping on each other's toes and and uh, rebuilding things that have already been built. So I just want to show you some screenshots of uh, how this works in DBT. Um, this is our kind of approach to lineage here, which is pretty cool. So we can see these. I don't know if it's going to come through on Zoom so well, but um, these are like source tables. So these are loaded for us by a tool called Fivetran that extracts and loads data from, in this case, uh, Stripe, our payments provider. So this is data landing in our data warehouse, which is Snowflake. And then all these blue nodes here in this lineage graph are transformations that are kind of stacked on top of each other. So we only need to solve some of these problems like one time, and then we can build on top of those derived data sets. Um, and then you can see lots and lots of interesting information here, um, like where the table lives in the database, for example. And this is a table called you know, Dim Stripe Customers. So I talked about version controlling your code. This is DBT's approach to doing that. And basically what it looks like is you create, you know, dot SQL files in a GitHub repository. And these SQL files are mostly SQL select statements. So um, this here is a, that's a common table expression if you're familiar. But basically it's just a SQL select statement. And the only big difference between DBT code and pure SQL is that we have this templating language called Jinja that allows you to refer to another table or in this case, another source. So um, this reference to a source table it's called github.stargazers, is how we automatically infer the kind of lineage that you see here. So you don't actually have to go and define lineage yourself. You just reference another table. Cool. I just want to show you a couple more things. Um, we talked about automated testing. This is pretty cool. This is uh, the same table we were looking at earlier, I think. Dim Stripe subscriptions. Dim is short for a dimensional table. And um, the big idea here is that we can run these tests, like in this case, not null. I'm sure this is really small on your screen. I'm going to try to help you. And I'm sorry if you can't see it. Um, so not null, Stripe subscription, subscription ID. So a database like Snowflake doesn't actually enforce you know, uniqueness and not nullness constraints. Um, most like data warehouses, common data warehouses, don't actually enforce constraints, but they will use them to optimize queries. Uh, but it doesn't stop you from putting null, null values into a, a column or duplicating values in a, what you say is a primary key column. So that's kind of scary. But you know, with something like DBT, you can actually just assert, I expect my subscription ID column to be unique and not null. And then DBT will check for you. And in this case, you know, the test pass, which is great. And so if ever you change your transformation logic in a way that violates this constraint, or if you get new data from the upstream source, in this case, Stripe, with duplicated or null subscription IDs, we'll alert you. You'll get an error message. And again, you'll find out about it before your CEO does when uh, their dashboard doesn't load. Okay, and the last thing I talked about is uh, the importance of developing and development instead of production. And so this is an example of, uh, we call this the DBT Cloud IDE. So this is in our SaaS product, uh, DBT Cloud. It's that same model we were looking at. I'm sorry, I'm saying model. It's that same SQL uh, code that we were looking at earlier, except here it's in a kind of integrated development environment. 
So this makes it easy to build this derived data set, um, run your tests, check out sort of the preview results of the query, and uh, manage all the files in your code base, commit them with Git and GitHub. Uh, and it, you know, our goal is for it to be like a one-stop shop for developing your, your DBT project. So in sum, you know, our goal is bringing software engineering best practices to data teams. Um, I know that everyone in, in this room is a computer science person, and so that might feel obvious to you, but I'll tell you that it's usually not the case out in the real world. You get a lot of people doing a lot of random stuff in the database, and I'm wondering why it's, uh, why it's all not working. OK, awesome. Give me a applause. Right, any questions for Drew? Yes. His question is, will the test be expensive for like the, the that you showed, would that be expensive to run? Yeah. You're running on lots of data. You're running lots of data, would it be expensive? I mean, Drew, you want to answer that? Yeah, totally. Uh, it can be. I think a lot of the power of DBT is that we run the queries that you tell us to run. Uh, that also means that if you do something inefficient, it can be expensive. And I heard you say if you try to select star from a billion row table, it can what overflow your yeah, alpha yes. buffer or something like that. Like same rules apply. So there, we have tons and tons of cost optimization stuff, like only checking the last seven days of data for uniqueness, not nullness, for because because you don't need to check very old data. Just say if you've already checked it. So lots of fa uh, faculties like that in DBT Cloud. So I'll say Drew can't say this, but I'll say it. They're not hosting the data. So yes, it could be expensive. They're not paying for it, right? <laughs> no, if you're the customer, it's your Snowflake database. You control it. You're telling DBT, make sure this data looks good. And like, yeah, it's expensive, but like, there's a lot of cases where, you know, fat finger mistakes or mistakes in data have cost people millions and billions of dollars. So yeah, you, you, it's worth worth paying for. Any uh, any last question? The worst table name I ever saw was uh, uh, they had it was called Table One, uh, and because they had Table One, Two, Three, Four, and then there was Table One Real and Table One uh, Old, and the production one was Table One Old. Uh, <laughs> that was the worst. Okay, let's give awesome. another, another round of applause. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil. Red still turns with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise to cool it off with St. Ives. <laughs> <laughs>